All right. We're going to go ahead and get this started. Um, Bruce Alcock is out today, so he asked me to step in and um, get everything started, get the recording started, and get everybody on track. So with that, I'm going to hand it. Uh, I think Gordy was supposed to be up first. Uh, but I'm uh, going to hand it to Daniel, and I'm going to go look for Gordy. All right, we're going to get started. Welcome to the 2023 September NREL newsletter meeting on Zoom. Today we'll be talking about the Texas Express with Gordy Robinson, the National Train Show that I had with Bruce, talking T-Track with Terry Moore, the train uh, speedometers with Arduino, I believe that's what it's called, with Thomas Rackers, and lastly, a live look at the Altoona and scale weekend with the NREL team. We'll hand it over to um, Gordy for the uh, Texas Express. Gordy? Hey, everyone. So, yeah, so the Texas Express, a uh, big thank you to all the NREL members that attended. Um, I'm just going to give you a summary of some of the things that went on there. Uh, in the time got, hopefully. So the convention was attended by 950 model railroaders from across across the globe, um, which is more than I guess, about 100, 100 more than the year before. So we're definitely getting back to where we were before COVID. Um, NREL members provided layouts at the convention itself and also at the National Train Show. We'll look at both of those in a little bit of detail, but the National Train Show, I know we've got a, that covered in, in the later presentation. So the Ops Road Show ran from Monday through Thursday at the convention. For many, it was a first taste of operations, certainly train, timetable and train order, um, an introduction to modular railroading and, and scale for many of the NMRA members that took part. The layout was 320 linear feet long, which made it the largest ops roadshow layout we've ever had. It was 123 different operators got to go through one of the tutored sessions. And at the end of the end of the week, we ran a big birthday train for Ed, uh, which we'll look at, which was seven, seven cars and seven locomotives. So a lot of what we do in the NMRA and a lot of what we do at NRAIL is to bring the community together. And how do we do that? Well, a lot of that's with common goals. So the common goal of this little group of Fremo N guys was to produce the biggest ops roadshow layout we've ever had, led by uh, Lee Corkins and and a few others. Um, in total, we had set at least 17 module owners. I might have got that on the side of caution. Um, and there was modules from uh, Utah, Oregon, Washington, Georgia, Texas, Missouri, Michigan, Ohio, and of course mine from the UK. So we'll give you a quick tour of the layout. Lee said everyone likes pictures, so I thought pictures was the way to go. Um, yeah. Isn't whoops. Hopefully you're not seeing that horrible bar at the top there. So if we start in the middle of the layout, this was the first stage in yard of the Ops Roadshow layout with the turn back loop at the back there to, to reverse trains. From there we came around into a, a small yard area, which was kind of running independently. So this this little area around the corner here was was run as its own railroad and switch crews here had to switch out an industrial area but they were using proto throttles everybody else was using engine driver and we throttle and as we came around the top of the corner you can see a few of lee corkins farragut modules there and we had the, this was a huge room that we we gave to the to the ops road show. It was seventy eight feet wide and double that in length. It was actually the room where the banquet was held on Saturday night. And so, as we came around, you could see there's a HO layout there. You could see how small the HO layout is compared to the end scale. When we come around the corner, we went down into one of the one of the small towns, um, and it, this is coming down the backside. Uh, coming down the coming down to the very bottom corner here. So that's I think that was 78 feet from one end to the other. And you see Michelle, this is one of Michelle's selfies. As we came around, we had a Y um, and we went into the speed yard. So we went into Speed's Murphy Yard, which was this um, down the center of the back section here, which was one of the one of the division point yards. So we've got two division point yards at each end of the layout and one in the middle. To come around the other side of the back wall, we entered another uh, set of modules. It was a, a switching area. So our, our, we had switch jobs, we had uh, through freights, we had yard jobs, every kind of job you could think of, you could run on the way out. Then we had this passing siding, 
by Fremo N standards, which was uh, a scale mile and a quarter, I think it was in length, which was so big that the ops guys decided it should just be double track. <laughs> I know, but I know for some of the guys on the call here, it would be, well, that's just a normal passing side in for Fremo, but uh, for the length of trains we were running on the ops layout, it was it was quite big. So this all ran as double track section all down this back wall. As we went around the end, we then get back into more towns and industry. So there's quite a run between the towns, which was which was quite good for for people to experience the benefits of modular railroading. Here we had another uh, switching district. This was all switched by the crews, and this went off um, off around in a in an L shape here in front of the dispatcher's desk. So we're now coming back down the centre of the room again, uh, coming through more towns and switching sections. We came around this quite quite wide corner here, um, and again then into another town. So you can see just how far the, the operators had to go between towns, which was, was really good. There was at least, we tried to get a scale mile, I think, but we, we got somewhere between a, a scale three quarters of a mile and, and about two miles between towns. We're coming through these S bends here and coming into the other stage in yard, the other division point yard here, which as you can see is um, it was a class a subended classification track classification yard, but we did have the line down the centre of the main to go through a reversing loop, which we had here, which also had industries and towns on it. So People needed to kind of run all over the place with these trains, which was was really well received. I guess that's the best attempt at an overall shot of the layout, and quite a lot of the layout's missing from that picture. But this gives you a general idea of, of just how big it is. If you look on the, I should have probably pointed this out before I started these slides, but all the way through the slides, I've boxed off the area of the layout you can see in the photograph. This photograph's taken from the top corner, underneath the. I suppose underneath the bit of gaffer tape there um, and you can see all the way down to the staging yard and you can see the other staging yard on the other side so the layout was quite the way around the ballroom certainly a lot of people were complaining of sore feet but that's only just good practice for Evanston I guess so the other sections were there was 12 of them in total they were all provided with a little bit of help from the Fremo N guys, OPSIG members, Women in Model, and then Women in Model Railroading had an OPS session, NRAIL had its own OPS session, and as I said, 123 operators uh, got to take part, and as if, you know, that's kind of the pictures of the whole week was just people operating non-stop on this layout. The picture in the bottom left-hand corner there, that's the OPS Roadshow crew, or part of the OPS Roadshow crew, I suppose. Um, John Young is missing from that picture, but that was the best picture I could get with the most people in it. Um, and this was the dispatching desk and the seats behind there was the crews waiting for jobs. So it was all very well organised. Um, and in the back corner of the big room, we also had a remote dispatching display in the evenings where we were dispatching one of the layouts that was available for op sessions. So the big birthday train, there is a video of this on the Fremo N Facebook group. So I'm not going to labour the point here, but um, just to say that it was Ed McNamara's birthday. So we ran a birthday train which was um, seven, seven cars and seven locomotives all the way across the layout. It took a very long time to get from one end of the layout to the other. And I don't think, it, I still don't think it exceeded the size of the passing side and down that big side that was double track. So yeah, this layout certainly swallowed a lot of trains. And there's, like I say, there's a video of this train going past that grade cross and it takes about two minutes and so we'll not watch it. So the National Train Show, I think the biggest... Um, if you weren't at the National Train Show, I think the biggest takeaway from the National Train Show was that uh, it's back with a bang. Um, certainly the numbers were where, back where we wanted them to be. And uh, Fremo and N-Track and T-Track, of course, you had the, the big layout, which I, I've got a couple of pictures of, but I know you're going to talk about it in more detail. So the National Train Show was over three days. The attendance was just over 11,000, bearing in mind 950 of those were the convention attendees who get, if you're an attendee of the convention, you get access early on Friday. That 11,000 doesn't count all the module owners and all the traders that were also in there. So we were looking at kind of a show population of, of somewhere just under about 14,000. 14, 12,000, 12, sorry. So about 12,000. 
from what I've heard from the vendors, sales were absolutely off the chart um, and record sales for some of them. So really definitely good. And apparently I've been told that Kilted Sundays is a thing. So if you're planning on attending the National Train Show next year or the year after on the Saturday, uh, Kilted Saturdays are now a thing and we'll, uh, we'll actively encourage you to bring your kilts along. And then, of course, it's optional. So the Fremo N, the T-Track and the N-Track, you guys all combined and big congratulations from us at NMRA for what was a fantastic and very fitting tribute to 50 years of N-Rail. Um, the overall, I have checked this and the 2023 National Train Show had more N-Scale model railroading than any other scale in terms of square footage given over to N-Scale layouts. So um, definitely uh, was a good showcase for N. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough, in my opinion, N-Scale vendors to back that up, but the N-Scale vendors that were there did particularly well. So uh, it's really, everyone appreciates everyone's support. So did you miss out? Okay, if you missed out, then why not register today for a future NMRA convention? So in August uh, next year, August the 4th to the 11th, 2024, We'll have uh, the NMRA convention, which and national train show will be in Long Beach, California. So advanced warning that uh, of dates. So the 10th, 11th and 12th of August will be the national train show if you're thinking of bringing modules. The registration is $195. The hotel will be the West in Long Beach and the national train show is directly across the street from the hotel. Currently, we are looking for a modular layout in any scale to provide operations at the convention. And if we don't have people come forward real soon, we're probably going to have to say not next year. Uh, we're going to try and do that on track warrants rather than timetable and train order because the team can't come out from Detroit next year. So we'll be doing things slightly differently. I appreciate that this is only two, week, uh, two weeks after Evanston, well, about 10 days after Evanston. But um, if anyone is interested and isn't traveling to Evanston, then do get in touch. Uh, for noting the website for the for next year's convention is surfliner2024.org. And then if you're looking a bit further out, in 2025, we'll have uh, the station number six or Novi uh, convention, which will be in Novi, Michigan, just outside Detroit. It will be July the 14th to the 19th. So it's a, if you've noticed, the dates are now shorter. It is a shorter convention as a tryout for one year. We'll see how it goes. We may continue it we may not if attendance and feedback isn't, isn't positive but the convention will run from tuesday to saturday um there'll be a lower cost of registration the hotel provides free parking we have multiple hotel options around the main hotel so we can cover all kinds of budgets uh, the national train show location is unfortunately about six miles away there will be buses to get there on at least the friday uh, but otherwise, you're going to need a vehicle. But as I say, everywhere's got free parking. It's definitely not like Grapevine or Long Beach. Registration's not open yet, but it will open in August of 2024. And we have already confirmed that we will have an Ops Roadshow Fremo N layout with timetable and train order, potentially with track warrants as well, op sessions that people can book into and take part in. And so for noting, their web address is uh, nmra2025.com. And I know that was a whistle-stop tour of what's gone on at the convention. I probably could spend two hours trying to cover all of the things that happen at an NMRA convention, but I would direct you to our YouTube channel uh, where you can see some videos from previous years of what's gone on or go and have a look at NMRA's Facebook and social media or the Texas Express social media and you will see uh, lots and lots of photographs and, and information about this year's convention and, and more things for next year. And just a big thank you once again to the NRAIL community for coming together to put on such a great layout at the NTS and also the Fremo N uh, team that put on the Ops Roadshow layout and all the members that attended from NRAIL. And I think, Daniel, that's it, and I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, sir. And I just got to say uh, thank you to everyone, Gordy and everyone on the Fremo N and all the other layouts out there who made the show a possibility and just seeing all the pictures, all the operators, that is an impressive feat. And I just got to say, congratulations. And I'm very proud of you guys for doing that. Or Daniel is John Wallace in Altoona. Can we go next? Oh yes, of course. Okay. Um, this is Altoona weekend, N-Scale weekend. 
Uh, we've got two floors in the Altoona Convention Center. Uh, we are set up outside because it's too darn noisy inside to be able to do this broadcast. But on the upper floor, we have a very large Fremo N layout and uh, an N-Track layout. Down on the main floor, we have something like 30 odd dealers all in scale and about 11 layouts. So uh, uh, definitely in scale here. Uh, lots of attendees from the public. Uh, they were kind of lined up about half an hour before the show opened. So uh, we, uh, we had a good time. Noisy, but uh, hey, the dealers seem like they're very happy. There's been lots of packages leaving as people are gone. And Pennsylvania is gorgeous. Horseshoe curves around the corner. So if you've never seen that, it's a chance to see that too. That, that's Steve Jackson, by the way. He's just off camera. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the the uh, Altoona Club has a great uh, clubhouse a building that's uh, purpose built for them. In, a large end scale layout on the bottom floor, and an HO layout on the on the second floor. Uh, we were over there last night running Cotton Brut, and uh, we'll be back again tonight. Uh, tomorrow we're going to make a tour of the layouts here at the convention with Cotton Brut and let everybody have a chance to run it. So that's it from, from here, Dan, Daniel. Go ahead with the regular agenda. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. And uh, I'm glad you guys are having a great time up there. I'm glad to see that the show is going very well. Uh, hopefully, I'll be up there next year. Um, coming up next, Terry Moore with Talking T Track. Uh, Terry, let me know when you're ready, and I'll hand the reins over to you. Thank you, Daniel. This month, I'm going to broach a, a topic that was asked. Somebody was looking for information regarding layout troubleshooting and also ways to efficiently head off layout wiring problems before the layout goes live. In a perfect world, layout wiring would always be perfect. It's not, and we need to find out why. Common layout wiring problems are the usual module wired blue, white, blue, white. Some people don't like the blue, white, white, blue format. Module leads color coded wrong, a common mistake. And then there's always the physical wiring of the layout where module leads are connected to the wrong bus. And rarely, but it has happened, causing great consternation, the white and blue track leads are connected together. Been there, fought with that. Also, another problem is the heavy bus cables that folks build for long runs can also be built wrong, which is usually just a matter of getting the color coding wrong and crossed up. Module testers. This is how you head off wiring problems before the layout is built. And Rail has published articles about module testers in past newsletters and presented them on Zoom Track. Primarily intended to test individual modules, they were designed to enable layout coordinators to test modules for standard compliance and avoid electrical problems created when non-compliant modules were added to layouts. A good idea but a daunting task when the number of modules requiring testing is in the hundreds, such as the mega layout in Kansas City for the 2018 NMRA National Train Show. As a result, layouts get built with untested modules and an electrical problem surfaces when the layout is powered up. Rats. Okay, let's test the layout all at once or in sections, depending on its size and configuration. But how? A continuity tester. Continuity tester is simply a battery, a light bulb or LED, modern form of a light bulb, some wire and a couple of probes. It is used to determine if there is a continuous connection between the two points the probes are in contact with. If the light illuminates, there is a continuous path between the two probes. Can't get any simpler than that. 
Some use a buzzer rather than a light, and you can't bring out the light bulb. When testing our modules or layouts using independent red and yellow buses, a, a normal, simple layout, no two rails should ever be in contact with each other. So the light should never come on. Wiring mistakes create rail-to-rail -rail contact so the bright light will tell us so. Now we must find the problem. For that, we will sectionalize. This represents a module, a single module, but it's just a module connected to a bunch of other modules in a layout. It just shows how the six tests are performed to see if any of the four rails are connected together somehow. They're not supposed to be, so the light should never come on when doing the tests. If a light does come on, there's a problem. Rule number one, disconnect all buses from the power supply. Connection to the power supply may give false indications and should the power supply be turned on, the power would damage the continuity tester. Also, remove all locomotives and rolling stock that are connected to track power for lights, sound effects, or whatever. Large layouts may be broken into sections by disconnecting modules and the red and yellow power buses at a chosen location such as a branch to spine taps or mid loop. This is a perfect world. No lights on all six tests. Test number one, yellow track, blue and white wires are joined. Test number six, red track, blue and white wires are joined. Like I said, doesn't happen, but it can happen. And well, it has happened to me, not my modules. This will not clear when the offending module is disconnected from the buses. The offending modules must be removed from the layout and corrected. Or this also indicates the presence of modules wired white, blue, blue, white basically the blue, white, white, blue standard reversed, a simple misunderstanding among newbies. This will clear when the offending modules are disconnected from the buses. The offending module may remain in the layout, but disconnected from the bus. This indicates a module or modules with track feeders labeled wrong. In other words, red and yellow mixed up or modules simply mistakenly connected to the wrong buses. This will clear when the offending module is disconnected from the buses. The offending module may remain in the layout disconnected from the buses. I'm not going to mention that, yeah, it could be corrected and reconnect, reconnected, but the primary objective here is to clear the problem ASAP and just simply leave the modules disconnected because we can live without a couple of modules connected to the bus work. This indicates a module wired blue, white, blue, white. Again, lots of people like to follow that format. This will clear when the offending module is disconnected from the yellow bus. The offending module may remain in the layout disconnected from the yellow bus. When sectionalizing, modules need only be disconnected from the yellow bus in an attempt to locate the problem. You don't need to disconnect from the red bus. The red bus does not have an issue. Oh, all the lights are on and all tests. Layout Armageddon. This indicates a module wired blue, white, blue, white, and a module with reverse color code. This will clear when the offending modules are disconnected from the buses and the offending modules may remain in the layout disconnected from the buses. For this presentation, this small loop layout of four six foot tables is our problem. The layout was energized, the power supplies were shorted, 
there is an electrical fault of some kind in the wiring of the modules. The layout has independent red and yellow loops with their own buses and standard blue, white, white, blue module wiring. A simple, basic T-track layout. Both loops in this case are DC, although it could be DCC, six of one, half dozen of the other with separate buses to allow a future red bus supply change to DCC later during the show. That's our scenario. Somewhere, the two buses are joined. But where? We need to find out. Now, the layout, the show starts in minutes. With the power supplies disconnected from the layout and all locomotives and rolling stock that use track power removed from the layout, the six tests are performed with the continuity tester across all six rail combinations. Since we know that only test number three and four show results, we do not need to repeat tests one, two, five, or six as we sectionalize this layout. Disconnecting the first module from the red and yellow buses did not solve the electrical problem. So we will continue. Disconnecting the second module didn't either, nor the third, nor the fourth, nor the fifth, nor the sixth. In this case, once the seventh module is disconnected from the layout buses, the fault is removed. This identifies this module as being the cause of the problem. Since the fault is now cleared, none of the remaining connected modules are suspect. But is it the only problem module? What about those modules that are already disconnected? Since the last module was found to be the cause of the fault, no further sectionalizing is required. So modules removed from the buses may now be added one at a time in any order desired, but testing must continue. Why? Because there may be other similar modules. As modules continue to be added to the layout buses, the fault returns after the second module is reconnected, indicating that it is also defective in the same way. Its presence in the layout was hidden by the first faulty module we found. Any number of defective modules may be hidden until the last one is removed and are only discovered as they are reconnected. In this case, both modules were supplied by the same person with the same problem. Once that module is again disconnected from the layout buses and the test indicates that the fault is cleared, that module is identified as being faulty. It can remain in the layout but must remain disconnected from the buses. One by one, each of the remaining modules is reconnected to the buses and tested okay in or any order desired with the defective modules remaining in the layout, not connected to the buses. Now, connecting those modules may be attempted after the layout is in operation, if attempting to do so does not prevent the operation of the layout. After all, it is all about the show. With the defective modules removed from the buses, but still in the layout, and all other modules confirmed okay, the power sources are reconnected and we are running trains. Yeah, but if ands or buts, the gremlins are still around. Large layouts may be divided into districts, uh, DCC speak for blocks, something like these five. Although all five districts may come from the same power source, each of the five feeders supplying the districts are independent of each other, so any electrical fault in one district will not affect the others. DC supplied large layouts use independent power supplies for each block, 
so a faulted block will not affect the others. In either case, in effect, the layout is already sectionalized. And this is assuming the isolation between districts is correct. More if ands or buts. So far, all I've talked about is the testing of simple standard loop layouts, those that have two loops of track, each supplied by their own bus, and problems that might be encountered. As I mentioned in my yellow bus talk and T-Track presentation, a separate yellow bus may not be required. In such cases, both the red track and yellow track can be supplied from a single bus. That changes things. And both tracks of a layout's fine single row of modules are supplied by the same bus. All of this applies to DC or DCC. But if you have a larger layout and use different wiring schemes, yeah. If the faulted layout or district is large, break it into two sections by separating modules and disconnecting the bus section and determine which of the two sections is faulted. If that faulted section is also large, break it into sections two and so on. And only the faulted section will require testing. After the faulted module is dealt with, reassemble the layout. <laughs> the hardest part is shoving a whole bunch of modules all back together again. So back to the single bus situation for both tracks. If both the red and yellow tracks are supplied by the same bus as in this single row spine, this is a correct indication that the blue rails of both tracks are connected together and both white rails are also connected together. That's the way they're supposed to be. But if an incorrectly wired module, such as a blue-white, blue-white module, is included in the spine, this is the visual result since all rails are connected together. Any red loops connected to the spine will also show test number one or number six fault. If both the red and yellow tracks are supplied by the same bus as in this loop, this is a correct indication that the blue rails of both tracks are connected together and both white rails are also connected together. Again, an incorrect wired module will cause all the lights to light up. Now here, if both the red and yellow tracks are supplied by the same bus again, as in this small loop that uses reverser cables to create a pseudo blue-white, blue-white condition, this is the correct indication that the blue rails of both tracks are connected together and both white rails are also connected together. And again, some kind of a faulty module will light up your world. This is the same situation, just a different way of doing the reverser. Uh, this uses a yellow bus reversed uh, at the connection to the red bus. The previous slide shows little individual reversers. Uh, that's also a method for small layouts. Same thing, only different. While I was at it, I'm just going to throw a little talking T-Track Mini in here. Um, although the power supply always supplies 100% of the power required by the layout, connecting it to the layout in the middle minimizes the voltage drop at the end of the bus by shortening the bus length and minimizing the electrical load on any bus section. The T-Track rails also act as a parallel power bus. Rail joiners are the most restrictive element to electrical power flow. Reduce the effect by maximizing the number of connected bus feeders. Power loading at any given location around the layout depends on the location of the trains. Even though a layout may be divided into blocks or districts, 
overload can occur when trains collect in any one place due to blocked movements or several sound equipped and or track power passenger trains accumulate in a yard. So I will now take the gremlins and go. Thanks for watching. Thank you for the educational slideshow, Terry. Uh, it'll, um, it was really good. I liked it a lot. Um, I, I was going to mention that I just started building my first T-Track module. And uh, I've been watching a lot of the previous segments of Talking T-Track and help with that. So coming up next, uh, we got the video um, by Larry Alcox. Um, it's about a nine-minute video. And uh, let's get that playing up next. Okay. And here we go. Is there any uh, narration or talking in the video? Well, this is going down the uh, helix that connects N track to T track. I was curious, how did that run during the layout or the show, rather? Pretty well, as long as you weren't trying to run too long a train going up the helix. There were, we had a couple passenger trains that were really long that had trouble going up the helix. Passenger trains are what, the auto train or? There's a couple guys that had some really long passenger trains that had no problem going down, but then going back up was an issue. Mm. I'd probably be that kind of guy who would uh, run a huge freight train that would stall in the helix. Is there any audio of the video? Are you not hearing the audio? No. Ah, okay. Oh, I was wondering why it was so eerily quiet. Yeah, it was, uh, it's playing fine here. Hold on a minute. The layout does look very nice, though, based on that short clip right there. The helix did as well. Go. There we go.
If this is all music, I can tell you what we're doing now is we're running through the Oklahoma N-Rail uh, T-Track module. We're going to take a ride up here and then we're going to cross over into Musselman's module. Is the uh, video paused right now or is it just lagging behind? We're rapidly approaching Teresa Goff's Best of Show module. from Musselman's modules back across to the other side of the Oklahoma N-Rail T-Track modules. We'll take, a, we'll take a left and go down there and then back to the helix. On the left up here is a little pond with a creature from the Black Lagoon swimming.
off the helix, we'll be moving on to the Oklahoma City uh, in track modules. We'll go around about three quarters of their layout until we get to the junction of the next club. It was a great video, and uh, thank you for presenting that. And um, does anyone have any quick questions, real quick, before we move on? I know there was a question in here about uh, can you explain the gradient and radius of a the uh, helicoidal ramp in, from N track to T track? Yeah, let, let me look that up. I can do that in a moment. You know, I want to do that at the end of the um, at the end of the show. Okay. Daniel, could you tell us who produced? that video and what was the camera that was used um i believe it's a similar camera to what we've had before in our layout a version of a gopro i believe um it was a uh, daniel was go ahead yeah the camera that bruce used was a panasonic so ah. the camera that she was used by joggers and that so very riding on very black car. and uh I john believe... mark you guys for your question i believe it was bruce alcock or uh, who uh, filmed the video. So that was Bruce's camera. I believe you were correct um, in what John just said. I think that's a Panasonic HX1 mini cam. And it is a, I think, an obsolete camera. I, I've tried to find such a thing um, only through eBay on, in Australia. <laughs> I think I've, I've seen it around. But it is a beautiful tube camera that does fit snugly into a well car. And so it does a, a great job recording. Uh, it was neat. Thank you. Interesting. Um, Lee, do you want to answer uh, Francis' uh, question real quick, or do you want to save it for the end? Uh, you're muted right now, Lee. He said he was going to save it to the end, Daniel. All right. And then, Daniel, I think uh, Lee was going to explain uh, the helix. Yes, I am. Let me go ahead and do a, a screen share here. Um This is from an article I wrote for the Intrac newsletter a while back. And um, to answer your question, uh, the, uh, let's see, the outer loop has a 21 inch radius. The inner loop has a 19 and a half inch radius. And what this does is it allows you, I have different, three different sets of posts that can vary the height of the helix in the convention. I was, or the National Train Show, I was using the seven inch. I also have a six and a half and a seven and a half. And on the um, seven uh, inch scale, the outer red gauge was 1.77%, and the yellow inner uh, grade was 1.9%. So that gives you an idea of uh, what it was. Why the difference in the uh, in the in the slope? Or the, and the inside and the outside rail? Yeah, it's very simple. The uh, inside rail has a, a shorter radius, and therefore it's going to have a steeper grade. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's going to be it's a shorter track because the radius is less. It's very interesting that helix right there. Uh... Uh, was it 1.5% was a grade, right? 
one point seven and about one point one point seven seven. I think one point nine five with right. the seven inch. I have different side posts. You saw those side posts in yeah. the railers. There's uh, eight pairs of side rails, and I have three sets of them. One of them is six and a half. One of them is seven, and one of them is seven and a half. So depending upon the difference between your end track and T track height, you can. Uh, and then the other half inch you make up with those little screw posts on the end uh, track side to get the right uh, difference between your end track track and t-track heights that's pretty neat uh, I, hopefully i can see one in the future at an upcoming show um does i think we're going to put it in the oklahoma city train show uh first weekend in november hmm. we're planning on putting it in that then we'll move on to our last segment for the day which is uh, uh train speedometers with arduino with thomas rackers thomas whenever you're ready i'll hand it over to you uh, i'm here um Asked if I do anything about doing um, train speedometers or track speedometers. I'm not sure which is the more accurate term. Um, we'll just um, not worry about that right now. But basically, um, there are de commercial devices you can buy that will measure the scale speed of a train passing by. And I wanted to see if I could um, whip one up using um, Arduino hardware and um, sensors. So I have a presentation on that. All right, so the um, the basics of what we're talking about, if you want to uh, measure the scale speed of a model train, um, you need the following things. First off, you need to know what the scale of the train is so that you can convert from physical speed of your model to the um, scale speed. That's pretty obvious. Um, you need to know which unit you want to see. Um, in this country, we, t we tend to use mile per hour uh, my trains all tend to be Japanese models, so kilometers per hour is what I would use um, if I was clocking my trains, in which case um, most of my end scales would be 1 to 150, but we can handle either of those cases. Okay, we need two sensors to detect the passage of the train, and to make this work properly, they should be the same type of sensors and mounted in the same manner to take out any variations of um, seeing the passage of the train. <clears throat> you need to know the distance between the sensors as accurately as you can get it. Um, and I'll, sh I'll show you my example when we get to that point. And the most important thing is you need to be able to measure how long it takes the train to move from one sensor to the other. And that's where the Arduino um, gets involved. Okay, so first we'll talk about the sensors. Um, nearly all the sensors that um, one would be using are going to be optical because they don't have to touch the train, nor do they have to um, make contact with the uh, rails. Um, so those sensors tend to fall into um, three categories. Um, sensors that the train blocks a beam from an emitter to a detector. Um, reflective sensors that where both are the emitter and detector are on the same size and it's looking for the light to reflect off the train. And then there's a third type. This is um, relatively new. A sensor that actually measures um, not a reflection, but it actually measures how long a pulse of light takes to get from the emitter to the train and back. And that way it can act, it's actually measuring the distance to the train. And this is the one I chose, but I'll show examples of all three. Um, here's here's samples of all three, and I'll go into some detail. Um, the ones on the left, um, that's um, beam break um, type, and there are two separate pieces. And um, they're, they're kind of large, but they weren't meant to be op used in um, like scale things. That'd be kind of thing you might use for... Um, Oh, I don't know, the movement of mechanical parts on some piece of machinery. Um, but they work in the infrared, so you wouldn't be able to see the light, but the uh, detector will, and that's the important thing. Now, another part, um, this is a reflective sensor. This is a very tiny little um, chip on a tiny little board. And if you, these are two pieces of N scale um, Unitrack. And if you look, if you look carefully, um, this board is sized, this hole is just the right diameter to fit over the blind post in um, the unit track. And this hole I cut out 
in both pieces of track so that if this is flipped over and fitted over if you flip this over and, and set it down on top of this the sensor peeks through the hole and basically is looking for the undercarriage of a passing train and um this piece over here um same sort of thing except the sensor is already mounted so you can see the um the black top surface of the sensor through there um these are good they they're not real quick responding not that that matters but um look using a sensor that's going to reflect off the bottom um it's kind of tricky to get a good accurate timing because not all the sensors are equally sensitive what works better i find is um this type of sensor time of flight it's actually a lidar which is like radar but it uses laser pulses um to bounce um light off of an object which comes back and it actually measures the length of time that that pulse took to go to travel and at the speed of light we're talking about times in the trillions of seconds but the chip can handle that and this chip can give you a measurement a reliable measurement from anywhere from five millimeters which is pretty small out to like a hundred millimeters which is on the order of four inches so um we just we'll set everything up so our trains are passing by within that range so um whichever sensor we use we would use two of them and this is the sensor that i'm going to be working with okay now the arduino part um on the left is the type of arduino i use this is actually the uh the newest ones the r4 um so this is this is the actually Arduino chip itself. Most of this is just space to um, give you support for the um, the shield, um, which is up here that fits into that. That's just the size that they've been for um, many years. So a lot of leftover space now because everything's more compact. Um, USB jack over here. Um, the shield um, is here to give me connections to... Um, short cables that will go to my sensors and you can see one of them here and also to my um my speed display um now if i wanted to make a more compact speedometer i would use this type this is a um a uh, micro arduino um, from a company called spark fun in colorado and the processor in here um, has the same power, same amount of memory, same processor speed and everything as the bigger one over here, but it's just way more compact. So if I were going to make a um, track speedometer that actually sat over or all alongside the track, I would build it around this. But for this demonstration, we're just going to go with this because I just had to whip it up. So, um, so this is the type of processor we'll be using. So you'll see that in the pictures. All right. How do we do a speedometer? Um, the basics are you have to have two sensors, obviously. And they should be mounted in the same manner and distance from the track. And both of those sensors connect to inputs on an Arduino. Now, the Arduino has an internal clock that your code can read that message, measures the passage of time um, down to thousandths of a second. And that's that's key to what we're going to do. Now, each sensor returns a signal that is either indicating I'm detecting or I'm not detecting. So it's just it's just a binary thing. It's there or it's not. Um, and then we'll go call our sensors A and B. Now I have to point out one interesting little detail with the sensor I'm using, which is actually measuring range, is that it will not return to the Arduino I detected it. It will say, I detect something that is this many millimeters away. Now, I can write my code and say, okay, I only want you to give me a detect if you say the thing is between 33 millimeters and 55 millimeters. Anything that's closer than that range or farther than that, I'm ignoring it. And we'll see an example of that. This also is useful if you put the detectors directly over the track. We can say, well, the track, if you're seeing something as far away as the track, 
ignore it. If you see something closer than the track, that's our train. So, okay, so now we have a sensor A and sensor B. And now the basic um, procedure that's followed in the code is our code is in any one of several different states. And it starts out, it's waiting for a detect on either the sensor A or B. Now, if it sees A at one moment and not B, it says, oh, I sensed A. Read the clock and make note of what time it says. If it happens to be B we saw, not A, okay, same thing. We're going to read the clock. But the difference is now, once we've sensed A, now we're only looking for B. And if we've sensed B, now we're only looking for A. When we find the one we're looking for, then we go over here. We read the clock again. Okay, over here we save it as tick. Here we save it as tuck. And then we immediately come over here and we can calculate the speed from talk minus tick. That's how many milliseconds passed between one detector seeing it or one sensor and the other. Now, once we've got that, we can display that. Now we wait until both sensors clear that there's no, tra there's no train detected by either one. And we go back and we start the whole process again. This is a simple model, but this is basically what's happening all the time. Okay. Now, once you got that time, you go through, you, through simple calculations to calculate your speed. The elapsed times, the difference of the two that you, readings you got. The actual speed of your model is the distance between the sensors divided by the time. But that was milliseconds, so we multiply it by 1,000 to convert, convert it to millimeters per second. Once we got that, okay, we want the scale speed. Take that, we need to convert we need a scale factor to convert millimeters to kilometers and one to convert seconds to hours and then include our scale factor, which depends on whether it's US N scale, HO, Japan's N scale is 150 if it's not bullet trains. Um, you go through all that. Now you have the scale speed in kilometers per hour. Oh, but we want miles per hour. Okay, you just change this part to one mile is one million yada yada millimeters. Stick that here in, in this spot instead and your calculation of scale speed will be in miles per hour. And the uh, demonstration I show, we'll see both of those um, available. All right, now this is the basic test setup up here at the top. You can see the Arduino and its um, connections to the, um, the sensor platform. And these two sensors are exactly five inches apart or 127 millimeters because the grid on this board is 0.1 inches. So we know the distance now, 127 millimeters. And this is positioned so that the um, desired range for a detect is somewhere between here, um, basically the near rail and the far rail. So we're only going to consider a detect anything that falls within this range, anything closer, which there won't be, or anything passing on the other train, it's going to ignore it. This Now you notice there's enough distance here. This would be a convenient way to mount sensors like this, say inside of a trackside building. You don't have to get right up close to the track because these are lasers um, shooting out. Um, put their pulses of beams reflecting and then going back. So it's a very convenient thing. Okay, uh, we'll get to see that laser. This is just a video of the um, whole thing powering up and you'll see me way off in the distance plugging it in. Okay, you saw the little light here, come on. That's our laser. We can't see it, it's infrared, but, ca but um, computer cameras, um, Phone or cell phones, they can see that. So that light is pulsing, and that's the beam that's going to be bouncing off of our passing train. Uh, let's see. Nope, I didn't want to play it again. Silly. Okay. All right. This is an early test. I want to make sure that I could see, could read the distances. 255 means it's out of range. Um, I'm not seeing anything. 
um, when we actually have the tram go by and you can watch those out. There's a display for each one. So when it passes by, it's like 30-ish millimeters or a little over an inch. So we are correct. We are properly sensing. And we actually, it's the tram's kind of short, so it disappears from one sensor before the other. But our code says once we see it on either one, we're watching for the other and we don't care what happens over here. No, 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 no. Next one. Here we go. And just as an example, on the other track, okay, see those about 60, 70 millimeters out. It bounces around a lot, but um, as long as it's within range, um, it's good. So we can see the um, even the farther um, train going by. No, 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 no. Here we go. Okay, now it's configured to actually measure speed. So trams going by. The red, there's a red light up here. It goes on. You see that? It means I detected on one sensor. I'm now watching on the other sensor. Um, and when I see it on the second sensor, the uh, display will update 39 kilometers per hour in scale speed. which is, was that about 25 miles per hour? Okay, now we'll do it again. Gonna run a little faster. I mean, it's gonna do the same thing, but you see, yeah. Now we're gonna, demonstrate that um it's only it can only count anything that's running on the um the near track see there goes a locomotive on the far track it ignored it because it was the code says that's too far away not looking at that but it will look at the one that is in the desired range Now, I could set the code up so that I'm actually watching the far track, but that's not real practical because then if a train goes by on the near track, it's going to block the view. We won't get it measured. So, But if you wanted to do it that way, you could. This is the show um, where I can switch modes. And you can see now there's a couple of jumper wires here. I have temporarily put it into modes where it's showing miles per hour, and it's using a MUS engaged which is 1 to 160 to calculate the speed and partway through it I'm going to pull those two wires out and both will shift modes it will switch to kilometers per hour and 1 to 150 scale which this tram actually is so it's just a matter of um, changing the operating mode okay miles per hour still And now the big giant finger enters the scene. Pops those wires out. And shifts to kilometers per hour. And that's pretty much it. It's a, it's a simple demonstration, but that's um, what I've come up with. And later on, I'm going to um, work on another version of the speedometer, which um, once we decide how we want to do it within uh, the RAN track group, whether to make it a portable test piece or incorporate it somehow into the layout by hiding sensors inside of structures. We'll see what happens. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, any questions? Hey, Thomas, where did you get your uh, your shields from? The, sh the red shield that I was using, that came from SparkFun because of the little black connectors on the edge, which are called QUIC. That's spelled Q-W-I-I-C. I can't help that, but that's what they spell it. 
but it's a um, an I squared C connection that goes to all sorts of sensors and displays and things. And both of my sensors that I was using, plus the little 14 segment displays on there, were all connected with that. So it's a convenient way to um, whip everything together without having to solder a bunch of connections and connectors and things right. into it. Yeah, the, I've, got um, my, I've got my R3 right here. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I got a bunch of R3s, but I bought a couple of R4s when they came out about a month or so ago. Um, all right, guys, to, the uh, the poll's going up now. Um, ah! <laughs> sorry to cut you off there, Thomas. No problem. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and mute. Open comment section. Finish all the polls up, Daniel. Uh, or repeat that. He can he can finish while the poll's up. I just want to make sure the poll was up in the corners. Of yeah, the- I just want to let everyone know. Um, you can continue there, Thomas. Yeah. Well, um, I'm open to any other question. I think I saw a question. It was in the chat. Um, is the sketch published somewhere? At the moment, it is a private repository on my GitHub. But once I get to the point where I'm willing to, um, where, where I've got cleaned up enough that I'm willing for um, other eyes besides mine to see it, I will shift it to public, and people be, will be able to find that. And um, I'll, if somebody reminds me of the uh, the place to post that, I will. Um, well, I'll tell you right now how to find that um, to look for it. Um, my GitHub is GitHub.com slash T W R A C K E R S. And then you'll look in there and there will be one that's called track speedometer. So the sketch will be in there and it's a lot more involved than um, what uh, my presentation showed uh, was trying in details, trying to make it sure everything worked properly. You were getting a simplified explanation of it because um, I otherwise would have taken like 45 minutes to cover this and it'd be way too much detail, but all of it will be there. So I will make it available um, on my GitHub. So Thomas, you want to give us that uh, address again? Uh, It was GitHub. Okay. GitHub, G-I-T-H-U-B dot com slash T-W-R-A-C-K. E R S. Just initials, last name. And then there will, it will be then slash. And when if when you first go in there, you'll see a list of of repositories in it. And there's a little thing at the top where you, if you click on that, it says repositories, you'll see all of my repositories, most recent first, and uh, track speedometer will be at the top of that list almost certainly. Okay. Does anyone have any uh, questions for anyone else uh, or any discussions I'd like to have real quick as the meeting is coming to an end? Daniel, I just uh, posted the reminder that today is episode 37. Congratulations, sir. You are leading us down year number four of ZoomTrack, and that's pretty awesome in the world of model railroading. There's not too many uh, groups that have this kind of continuity, and it's a credit to everyone, everyone that's been on here. I mean, these audiences have been very consistent from the very beginning. Thank you, sir. Uh you, you know, it's a, I, I think it's an honor for me to be here, of course, and uh, the Razor Jill gave me the uh, opportunity, and of course, again, Rail Board as well for me to be here. Does anyone else have any questions for uh, any of our presenters today or NRAIL, anything like that? Nope. All right. Well, thank you for attending the uh, 2023 September August uh, Zoom track meeting, and I hope to see you guys at the next meeting in October. You guys are going to Altoona this weekend or any other train shows for the rest of this year. We hope to see you there. We hope you enjoy the train show. So thank you very much for attending today. And we'll we'll see you trackside or by the layout. Thank you. Great job, Daniel. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Of course. All righty, everybody. We will see you next time. All right. All be the same. See everyone later. See you in next month. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night for me and good morning for you. Bye. Mm-hmm. Stephen, Stephen Corlew, I see you're the last man on the on the audio here. Do you want to say anything from Altoona? 
tell us what you're seeing if you can. I, I actually it looks like his phone's connecting. Yeah. Yeah, he's been uh, on and off. His audio has been on and off. I'm willing to bet that the uh, Wi-Fi in Altoona was very bad. It wasn't. It wasn't optimal last year when I was there. Yeah. Who who did you you were interviewed by somebody last year, weren't you, Daniel? It was um, uh, DJ's trains last year. Man, that was already a year already. I can't believe that's it. that's right. He asked you to introduce him for his channel, right? Well, it wasn't necessarily that. How about. It? <laughs> But he, he used it as that. I'm very proud that, you know, I was I was there to shake his hand. I've been watching his videos for years. And uh, I didn't know until recently, about uh, maybe six months before that, that he actually did end scale, which I found was really interesting. True. And uh, Klondike, I just assembled my first module from you uh, yesterday at a workshop for our club. And I'm, I really got to say, I really love the module. Really well built, really well, um, really easy to assemble. I'm, I'm, I just got to say thank you for... Uh, um, uh, presenting your modules last uh, Zoom track meeting. More than welcome. I'm glad you enjoy them. I had to toss one extra one in there for you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I didn't notice that until I had uh, taken the other module. I was like, wait a minute. This is an extra module. So again, thank you. You're more than welcome. Mr. Luger, good to see you, man. Yeah. Uh, did you see the post that uh, we're all heading to Dan? Danville next, and it looks like it's going to be three and a half inches height of the T track module, right? Thumbs up. Awesome. Daniel, I assume you're still going to Danville. I mean, I sure hope so, given the uh, plans <laughs> we've made. Yes, sir. And again, also for anyone here in the North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia area, or if you're not in the area, you should go to Danville next weekend. We'll be hosting a pretty big or moderately sized train show for the area. And track and D track. This Hello. is Danville Rail Days number twenty one. And we've been doing this since nineteen oh since nineteen oh three since two thousand three with the commemoration of the nineteen oh three wreck of the old ninety seven. You guys have been doing this longer than I've been alive. <laughs> oh Lord! And, and that's, that's why you're the host, Daniel. That's why you're the host. <laughs> I retired from the Navy in two thousand three. So, and now I got, I'm at my 20 year mark with uh, Florida State University. So I've only got a few years left there and I'll retire again. So, and how long before uh, they're going to retire you from the NMRA? Hopefully never. No, uh, as long as I keep swinging a stick, they'll keep me. There you go. So, all righty, guys, we're going to go ahead and end it because I don't want this recording to be huge. It's already going to be big. So, sounds good. All right. Y'all have a great evening and uh, we'll see you next month.